Welcome to the Elemental Awakening. Hey everyone, welcome. Gio here again for another episode of Elemental Awakening, where I bring you people that I find super interesting to share some of their stories, insights, and knowledge with the intention of, you know, inspiring people to make a change in their life or try something new or just spark that intuitive curiosity. And today I have with me a very interesting guy by the name of Sam Morris. He's the founder of Conscious Warrior Brotherhood and also managing director of Five to Flow and a few other amazing things that this guy's up to that we're going to talk about and dive into. So welcome to the, to the show, Sam. It's great to have you. Thanks, Gio. Awesome to be here. And yeah, good to see we're so aligned on many things. Cool. So, so yeah, you, you just actually, um, from what I'm checking from your social feed is that you just finished a, a Ted talk. Um, but before getting to that Ted talk, I would love to hear a bit about the backstory of who you were and, and who you've become that's led up to sort of these new endeavors that you've sort of been embarking on. Yeah. Um, so the, I'll give you the, the medium length version since we're a little bit short on time, but, uh, it's, uh, I started off as in Vermont. I was born, um, my family was amazing. Like forever, for most of my life, I looked back at my childhood and thought, this is an amazing childhood. I, you know, I was playing golf and tennis and baseball and soccer and just skiing on the mountains in Vermont every winter. And like, that, I grew up in Vermont. And so I never really thought much about it until I got later in life when I, you know, some of the trauma from childhood came about, like it, it reared its ugly head, so to speak in the form of really toxic behavior, addiction, alcoholism, um, inability to hold relationships, inability to hold jobs and all this. So I, I, when I started looking back at my childhood, you know, I, I took a look at the fact that I was very sick. Um, I had severe asthma and severe food allergies, which to say I wasn't aware of is wrong, but I didn't put, I didn't think about it much as like this matters going forward. It was more like I, I went through that and I survived through the asthma attacks and the allergic reactions and I, I would choke on my food a lot. So I had these things that I was dealing with, but as a kid, it was just, I'm getting through this. And so it wasn't until I looked back that I started to look at how that shaped my child, my adulthood and my life and how I showed up as a person, which was a lot to do with external validation, external love, external saving. And so um, through my childhood, the way that, the way it showed up in childhood was that you know, when I, if you're eight years old and you're having a severe asthma attack and it's two in the morning, you can't, you can't really get yourself to the hospital. So you really, I would actually physically have to be saved. Um, so that happens so often and for so long that it was all I knew. And, and so for me, like the things like self-love and I couldn't trust my own body. And so like, I would always have this kind of anticipation of like, am I going to have an asthma attack today? Or am I going to eat a peanut today? Or what's going to happen today that's going to threaten my survival? So, you know, it was a lot of fight or flight, a lot of being on. And, um, you know, the way I, there's, there's two ways to look at that. One is that it, like I, I've developed this a massive vigilance, but vigilance is really a fear-based reaction to it. You know, to be vigil is to be on the lookout for threats. Whereas, um, transmuting that later in life into what I do now is more of an observance where I, instead of being vigilant about it, I can observe with the love and the confidence in myself, knowing that I'm seeing what's happening. And this serves me really well with my clients is that I can see what's happening, but I don't have to react. I don't have to be in that fight or flight. So through that saving conversation, it basically, it became a program for me so much so that um, I would manifest relationships jobs, addiction and addiction and alcoholism, reasons for people to save me because that became honestly my proof of love. Like it was how I mattered. You know, I didn't, I didn't ever have any kind of validation other than like, you need to be saved from an asthma attack. And then later in life, it was addiction, like send it, go to rehab. And so um, one of the things that actually did, you know, quote unquote, save me and became like a, a life force for me was tennis. So playing tennis and golf every day all summer, I would, uh, tennis is what stuck and I fell in love with it. And um, it allowed me to create an identity outside of being that super sick little kid. And so um, that got me all the way through college, college, college scholarship. And then after college, um, my, my tennis career ended and I was left with this void. I was left with this, like, no identity, no place to turn. Like what, what's next for me? Because really, honestly, like my dream and my life goal was to be a professional tennis player, like follow Andre Agassi and Pete Sampras and all those guys. And 
And so when my tennis career ended, like I didn't really have much to fall back on because I didn't, that was my fallback. It was my, it was my priority and my fallback. So what happened was, is that tennis really what it was, was it was my savior and it gave me that safety and that validation, but it also was a defense against um, addiction and alcoholism for me. It was, a, it was a defense against, like it, it, it kind of allowed me to avoid looking at the childhood traumas because, you know, when I was out there playing tennis, I was getting the accolades and I was getting the validation and I felt okay, but really I wasn't doing anything to address like the real lasting impressions and programs from that childhood. So um, when tennis went away, I, I, I fell into addiction and alcoholism and that lasted for 15 years and it was just a trail of wreckage, you know, 15 years of broken relationships, lost jobs, uh, five trips to rehab, six DUIs, multiple times in jail. Like I just, I, lots of consequences and not, not just for me, but for the people around me, family, the friends, like it, it became at the end, you know, there was a very few people that even wanted anything to do with me because it was just such, so reckless, uh, so chaotic. And so the end came when I was 38 years old and really like, I didn't plan on ending. Um, I was in the middle of a four day bender and I just, all of a sudden, I realized that the next day I was supposed to move out of my house because I had lost my job so I couldn't pay rent and I had lost my girlfriend and my dog and I had just spent eight nights in jail and I was sitting there at my table and just like this awareness or this like, I don't even know, to this day, I don't know what it is, but I know at that moment I decided that this can't go on. No matter what I did, no matter what I do, I can't be in fear anymore. I can't be in hoping I'll get saved anymore. I can't be in this reckless, careless, just destructive behavior anymore. And so from that moment, I just decided that I was going to look at whatever I need to look at to, to heal the childhood traumas. And this is when I, you know, I had started looking at this stuff, but I was still in and out of like drinking and not drinking. So I wasn't really getting much work done, but I had been kind of awakened to the idea that like, there's some other things at play here. It's not just me partying. And so um, from that day, which was November 21st, 2012, it's been a journey of just like searching and um, establishing spiritual connections and establishing, you know, brotherhoods of men and, and doing the work with, with psychedelics and doing the work with, you know, started off in AA and therapy. And then it's moved on now to more so like Sacred Sons kind of men's work and, and doing the psychedelics to get, because what happens is after a while, you know, like we, we get comfortable, we handle the things that we know about. We handle the things that we need to handle that are very glaring to us. Like for me, it was social anxiety was a huge reason I drank. And so I handled that. And then after a while, you, you know, the, the same old patterns keep showing up, but you keep applying the same lessons to those patterns and they keep showing up. It's like, well, there's something here I don't know about. So for me, the evolution has been like, what is it that I don't know that I need to know so that I can really get past the healing. So I feel like for the first six or seven years of my, of putting down the drinks and getting into the recovery was work to get to a point where I can really start healing. And then once I, cause once I handled all the stuff, like the, the, the depression and the anxiety, the childhood trauma that I knew about, it was like, all right, so what about that stuff is sticking? Where, where, what, what hooks are left in me from that stuff? And that's really where, you know, getting into like the, the next level of healing with the psychedelics and the men's work and getting really, really freaking vulnerable with other guys that, that's gotten me to the point of, um, what I do now, which is I, I provide that space for other guys. So the, all the healing work that I've done it brought me to this place of my purpose, which is holding space for men to heal. So, you know, I basically was like scared to look at everything in life. I was scared to look at what might be wrong or what might be a hook. And so I know that I'm not alone in that. Like other men struggle with being really scared of like saying, I don't know, getting vulnerable saying I'm scared, like those things are big. And so when guys can address those things and look at those things and look at, not even just look at the things, like you have to almost reverse engineer the events of like the experiencing a pain or experiencing a, an angry outburst or something. Like, okay, how far back does that go? And so that's what I had to do. Just go back and find the, the real root and the, 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 you know, the, the place where this hook exists and, and uproot it. And so that's really what's gotten me to this point today of like, you know, I, it's funny, I just made a post about like the book is never done. 
on Instagram. And so like, you know, it's, uh, it's very easy to think like you get to be good enough. Like I'm good enough, which means like I'm out of pain. Things are okay. You know, money's good. Girl's good. Family's good. But that's that good enough is a pretty dangerous little place to be because you can easily stop doing the work and get out in front of your ski, get out over your skis and, and you're going to face plant. And so just to recognize that the work is never done is not a death sentence or a, or a, a, something that you're going to be in forever. It's just recognizing that, Hey, like I've handled the big stuff. Let's just be stay, stay observant and stay not going to be an observance, be, be witness. I love that. And, and I think that, um, like another way you can even look at that is once the healing is done, you know, that's where the fun starts. That's where now I got all this, these anchors, these, these hooks, as you were calling them, I've removed them and I don't have to be on, on watch because the fear is falling back into that old you. But for me, true healing is being able to break free completely and go on to what's next to start exploring what you never had access to before, because you're always, in that sort of state of dealing with pain and, and covering up these feelings. And so now what, what is that unlocked true potential? What, where is that, where can that take us? And it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's always an upward trajectory. So some of the lessons will come as, as different types of falls and doesn't have to be the same pattern, but you may get challenged in different areas as a man, as a business person, as a lover, or all the aspects of the, the different aspects of our life. You know, you may have learned a lesson about, you know, safety and, and, and being independent. Great. Now we got to, now we got to learn about all these other things that we, we may have taken for granted or had no awareness of. And, and that's where I think it gets interesting. And, you know, once you've healed from something, whenever you start going down another maybe rocky road, it's like, remember, hey, I've, I've gone through something like this before and I've persevered. I've been able to pull myself out of it. And, and I'm going to welcome this next challenge because I think because I know at the end of the tunnel, there's something there for me. The unknown here is going to be dark and scary and, and lots to uncover. But if I can stick through it and, and ask for support when I need it and work through this, I'm going to be even a better man or better person uh, on the next stage. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that um, I love your story and I love some of the insights that you got. And I would love for you to just maybe get a little bit more uh, in detail for people who might be going still through that first stage, those little nuances. Cause you said, you know, like I started realizing maybe the problem wasn't me or the drinking that it was maybe like a side effect or a symptom of something that was underneath that had to be addressed. And like, how do you start figuring out like, wh what do I need to address? Cause I think a lot of people are blindsided, you know, they're looking at the mirror saying I'm a fuck up or, you know, I have a drinking problem or I have a sex problem or I always ruin relationships with so negative self-talk, not realizing, Hey, maybe there's something that's, that's causing these actions or just pain that is causing this. So if you can give me some insights into how to start um, uncovering that, or maybe what worked for you in, in the early days. Um, and then we can get into more of the more deeper work with the, with the men's group. Cause I think some guys, they hear the idea of crying with other men. They're like, Oh no, there's no way I could ever, you know, do that. Um, but we'll get to that because that's, that's where I like to operate in as well. So yeah. So tell me a bit about the, the early realizations and how people might be able to start, you know, paying some awareness to some of those signs. Yeah. So it's uh, the good news and the bad news on this are pretty much the same. So the bad news is, is that it's, it's repeated pain. Is, is what really tripped me first is that you, you, you experience a pain from like, say a heartbreak and you're like, okay, let me get, let me get un heartbroken. Let me heal my heart. And you're like, I'm good. And then you repeat, and then the same thing, three years later, you're in the same spot. So like, obviously what you did to heal that initial heartbreak, what you did is you got over the heartbreak, but you didn't heal the cause of the heartbreak. You didn't heal. Um, why I had a really, really good buddy of mine after my last heartbreak a couple of years ago, he asked me, um, it was, what did he say? He said, I, I always say, I, I think I said, I always end up here in like this heart, like it's a three-year cycle, like a three-year relationship, heartbreak, three-year relationship, heartbreak. And he's like, well, you say you always end up here, but like where, what, but where inside of you allows you to end up here all the time? Like that's what you need to look at. And that's when I got deep into stories about other people and about saving and about all this stuff. So the, the bad news is that it takes, it, it usually takes pain at first. Uh, the good news is, is that pain is always your teacher. So once you handle a certain pain, that pain is gone. That pain, 
is that particular pain is no longer an issue for you because you've handled that pain. And so when I say handled it, I mean, going through the cycle of it multiple times is not handling it. Handling it once and for all is the handling it. So finding out why, where, where is that place inside of me that always keeps allowing the heartbreak to happen? Or why do I always get fired from jobs? Or why do my friends always you know, not include, whatever it may be. Um, eventually what happens is that the, you recognize the, once you start reverse engineering those pain events, you can start to see them coming from miles away. So that, like eventually you get to the point where like, okay, like I noticed my patterns cropping up here. Like I noticed my, my self-sabotaging pattern happening in this relationship. Let me address this and stop it before it gets to the point where my heart is completely shattered. But the fir at first you, you almost, you have to experience that pain to, it's really the, I mean, I don't, there's, it's really the best way at first to experience really lasting change is like you, you got it's a rite of passage the pain is a rite of passage so almost like leaning into the pain and not trying to avoid it and, and trying to sit with it and see what's actually beyond that feeling of pain it's like what's really causing this pain you know because i think it's easy to sort of reach yeah, for yeah. something to drown it out but really what we need to do is sort of ask the deeper questions as to why do i keep feeling this and feel it yeah absolutely yeah, feel it and then get past the good enough. Get past the just remove from the pain because just remove from the pain, you're in major jeopardy of always being pulled right back in. But if you can go past like just out of the pain, just good enough and get into the point of like, like you just said, finding out why it's, why did that, why is that there? Mm -hmm. What's the real root of that? Then you can really like almost bulletproof yourself from it. Yeah. And, and so, so from there, like, you know, I think a lot of guys, um, I'm generalizing here, but um have this mentality of like you know it's not okay to ask for help and i gotta deal with this myself and i gotta be a man and i gotta have a stiff upper lip and you know take it on the chin and just you know do my thing and i think that you know the, the modern day tribe is dissolved you know the initiation you know to becoming a man and having this the brotherhood or even community you know even even without a brotherhood i think even just having a community to be a part of you know the brotherhood even takes it to the next level um, but talk to me a bit about your experience of that and how that came into your life and helped to evolve your healing and transformation and, and what, what role it plays. And, 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 and again, like I always love highlighting for people that transition of when maybe you weren't sure about it or you first heard about it and how it sort of shifted your perspective of it for you, if there was a shift. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, I recognize that resistance to it a lot. For me, it was, um, I don't, I wouldn't say that I felt the resistance that, a lot of guys do these days um but i did definitely feel like this is awkward this is uncomfortable like i can't like it's that thing about like wanting to be accepted and wanting to be accepted the story we make up in our head is we want to be accepted so we're not going to show weakness you know like if, if we show weakness we're going to immediately be you know excommunicated from the community if we show like if we say i don't know we're going to look stupid and people are like oh, i want to hang out with that guy he doesn't know mm. you know we we it's, it's black or white for us in our heads a lot. Whereas the real learning curve for me came when it was like sitting in a room with guys or even just one-on-one -on -one with a guy, like a brother of mine and just saying, I'm struggling right now. I am fucking hurting. I'm struggling. My heart is broken. Um, I just like, whatever it may be at the moment, like it could be something massive. Or it could be something small, but just saying I'm really uncomfortable right now. And they don't even have to say anything. It's just, there's magic and there's power in that. Um, getting together and then there's the, the the community and the tribe like when you say com community is great because I mean obviously men and women fat masculine and feminine like we're all one and we have to learn to interact together but and then the next level is the men the men need men the women need women women and men need each other and when we can have those three outlets the you know the the intertwined community community and then the women can have the women and the men can have the men the women have been doing it forever men it's pretty new but when you can have that place because basically what it is is like if, if men, I, what I find is that if men don't have a place to go, and this was me too, like the only, like we automatically go towards like a relationship. And then within that relationship, we start lashing out. I start, I'll speak from my experience. I, I would lash out. I would either act out by like cheating. I would go off and drinking. I would, you know, just become like closed off and rejected. Like I would reject my woman. And like, it was because I didn't have a place to go talk about all the things with other guys and you can like there's so much to be said for communication within relationships but 
you can't just like fire off at the hip with like, I'm angry at this. You know, you have to be really conscious and really compassionate about your communication. And the best way to establish that is to find a safe environment with other men to talk about it. And then that it's basically like the a pressure cooker, you know, like when you can find other brothers and, and communities and tribes to go do that with brotherhoods, the steam from that pressure cooker is totally, totally relieved. And then you can go back and, and whatever situation that was struggling, you're struggling with, you have perspective, you have clarity, you have um, strength and power. And you have, basically you have the, you have the support of five, 10, 15, 50 guys behind you that have accepted you already and told you that you're okay. And then having that and going back to like, just use a relationship in that, uh, um, example, going in with that, as opposed to like the shower argument where you're like, you know, the shower argument where you have the argument in the shower for 15 minutes. And then you, you already got yourself amped up. Cause like, we're going to fight. And, you know, if you can like dissipate that and come in with just calmness and knowledge and, and, you know, like I always, I say like, my thing is like, be a warrior, don't be at war. And you can come in like in that warrior archetype and not, not being with your sword drawn, your sword still in the sheath. That's the place where things like, that's like real growth and real connection and real love. Amazing. So, so one thing you talked about was sacred masculinity. So, yeah. so how would you define that in this context that you're speaking about right here? And how, how does the tribe fit into that and, and from the individual and the group as well? Wow. Um, it's really what it comes down to is like, I just said, like being, being a warrior, not being at war. It's, it's basically sacred masculinity is looking at the things that are bothering you, scaring you, confronting you, threatening you, and not either looking away or responding in some toxic way. Like mm -hmm. when you can stand in that power and not be destructive when you can, because so toxic masculinity is a term that I almost don't agree with because it, 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 it implies that the man himself is toxic. Now the behaviors that the man exhibits are definitely toxic, but the man himself is just wounded. So when we can handle those wounds and step into our divinity and step into our power and the beast, like legit be scared and say you're scared like i'm scared and i'm doing this anyways that's like the epitome of divine masculine to me is like a shaken masculine is saying that you're experiencing i'm having this experience right now but i'm here for it and i'm here for you and that so if you can if a man can do that the masculine can do that for himself then you know the feminine or his brothers can see him doing that and can go to him and say i saw you do this i'm i'm struggling right now I need your help. And that's mm -hmm. when the sacred masculine can stand there and, and receive and hold space. Right now with the brotherhood, that's where that's like the training ground. <laughs> you know, that's the practice. That's the football practice, baseball, whatever hockey, you know, that's like where we go and we, and we make mistakes and we, and we get ugly and we cry and we lash out and we yell and we just let it all out because then when we, when we have that, that uh, release, you know, we, we don't have to bring that, we don't have to bring that bottled up toxicity into the world. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And, and I think it's about, you know, being, you know, sacred masculinity is allowing yourself to be vulnerable. And, you know, really just redefining courage is, is, is not showing that you're not afraid. It's, it's admitting like, yeah, I'm afraid, but I'm going to do this anyways, you know, I'm going to mm. go through and see, see it through. You know, and being able to admit that or, you know, stand up tall and say, okay, look, you know, like, I know this is going to be painful, but I'm not going to try to avoid it or pretend that I'm, I'm not, I'm just going to like face it, you know, and, and, and having the courage to sort of do those kind of things to be vulnerable. Um, and I think it's something like a topic that is coming up more and more as, as, as I see just in our own men's group community, just more and more guys are just feeling lost and scared and don't have an outlet to communicate or be vulnerable and, you know, they, they come in usually with similar experience to you where they're afraid of being rejected and not sure. And as soon as they realize, hey, all these guys are way more like me than they are different from me. And they don't give a shit about what my story is. You know, they're here to support me. As long as I show up, they're here to support me. You know, that's it. I just got to show up. I just got to come here and say, hey, guys, I'm I'm here. And 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 and. I think yeah. like this is something that needs to spread to like everyone, you know, like I think there's so many guys that don't know this exists probably right around the corner from them. You know, these are just maybe their awareness isn't there yet. Um, but anyways, what I'm trying to say is, is that um, I, I love this work so much and I think it's so needed right now. Um, and I just, 
I guess I don't even know how to sort of promote it. I guess it's just something that happens naturally. Like when you hear the calling, because I can tell someone about a men's group all I want until they're sort of ready to say like, Hey, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this or I'm going to come check it out. I guess that calling comes from yeah. within similar to that, like that day when, you know, just one day you just felt like, Hey, it's time to change. Like, you know, I'm not doing this anymore. I've been through this for however many years and now I'm ready. Um, and I guess that brings me to like the next sort of topic that you sort of mentioned that you, 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 you like to talk about, or it's important to you is that the topic of surrender, right? Mm-hmm. The topic of, of surrendering to life. One of my favorite books of all time is Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer. Um, you know, some of the concepts in that book I've adapted into my everyday life whenever I feel things aren't going the way I want them to, or the world is getting crazy. It's just like, okay, like we don't know how this is going to turn out. I just need to keep showing up as who I am. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll see how things unfold, you know? So tell me about what, what surrender means to you, why it's something that is important in a way as in your way of life. And I guess any, anything else you want to sort of bring up in regards to, uh, surrender. Oh, surrender, my favorite. Um, you know, I, I would say it's, it's new to me, but it's, it's not new, but my embodiment of it is definitely new. Um, and this started with a, a Bufo ceremony back in December and, uh, you know, I spell, I'll start with the way that I spell surrender. So I spell it S-U-R-R-N-D-R, no E's. Because until you can um, put your ego aside, there will be no surrender. Because the ego, although it wants to keep us safe and it does a good job and it's there for a reason and we have to love it and all that stuff, the ego, to, to, to the ego, surrender is like the worst thing ever. Like if we surrender, we die. That's what he, that's the ego's translation of surrender. And so until you can like get a hold of your ego and transform your ego into being, you know, the teammate that says, okay, we're by surrendering, we're going to now experience more love, more connection, more success, more abundance, whatever it is that we want to experience. Like the best way to do that is to surrender to what's happening, not how you think it should happen. You know, not how you think it should look. You know, it's like if someone says, um, I want to be a millionaire in five years. They're like, okay, so this, this, how this is going to look is that I'm going to go get a job and I'm going to get promoted three times. And eventually I'll be making $83,000 a month and I'll be a millionaire in five years. But then they, they pick up a a lottery ticket and they say like, oh, but I don't like the number 13 on that lottery ticket. So I'm going to throw it away. And that lottery ticket is a million dollar lottery winner. They're like, it didn't, it didn't look like how they thought it was going to look because they were so attached to the how they hadn't surrendered how it was going to happen. And so by not surrendering, you close yourself off. You close yourself off to all other possibilities. Um, Another analogy, I love analogies. There's another analogy is like, if you're, say you go to work, you drive to work the same day, same road every day. And then one day you're like running five minutes late, but then you get on the road and there's construction. So you're like, crap, I'm going to be 15 minutes late now. But the guy, the, the detour takes you on this new road that you actually end up getting to work five minutes earlier and you had no idea that road even existed before, but what you had that, that being late and that construction forced you to surrender to another way. And it turned Mm -hmm. out being better. Right. So, so that, and that goes for everything in life. Like when you can surrender to maybe there's a better way and it doesn't even mean like always changing things up, but it means always being surrendered to the experience that you're having in that moment. Like with meditation, I think a lot of the reason that people struggle with meditation is because they never surrender. They have an idea of like, oh, I can't, like that thought doesn't belong in meditation. Like you could be meditating on, um, you know, abundance. And all of a sudden some thought about a day when you were five years old riding your bike with your friends comes into your head. You're like, no, no, it doesn't matter right now. I need to get that thought out of my head. Like, no, there's probably something about that day that's blocking you from abundance. But in order, until you can surrender to that thought and that experience and that flow, you're going to be blocked off. And so my, when it comes to surrender is shutting down the ego and just letting like, you don't even have to like ego death is a word I don't like to use because it implies exiling the ego. And like, we don't, you know, it, it's not about that. It's about integrating the ego and making it your teammate. And Michael Singer talks about that too. in this other book, the, uh, the, the untethered soul. Yeah. He, the, the terrible roommate, right? Like he, uh, so he talks about that. Like, when you can like incorporate all parts of you and then surrender to the experience that you're having in the moment, so much, everything opens up. 
like you get to be present, you get to be loving. The chatter, like for me, anxiety was a big thing. And like, and the, there was so much chatter in my head because I was constantly judging and fighting and the vigilance versus observance, vigilance versus witness. And so when, when you can surrender that chatter quiets down and you can look your brothers, look your wife, look your girlfriends in the eye and be like, I'm here for you, I'm here. Like, let's have a good time. And let's like, I'm, and I, I constantly remind myself you know, if I feel myself drifting or getting spun out on something, it's like, no, no. surrender to this experience. Just surrender mm, to it. If you're absolutely. here, enjoy it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, you mentioned Bufo, um, which is almost like a forced surrender. I, I know some people that will fight through it, like to the death, but, you know, I yeah. think at the right dose, like, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to hold on long enough. Um, tell me a bit about the role psychedelics played. You know, my, my perspective is that, you know, they're a tool, they're never an answer in themselves and they open you up to greater depth of, of work and commitment to yourself. If you really want to see long lasting change, but let me know how um, psychedelics played into your story. And, and I know you mentioned that um, also was something um, that was important to you. So tell me, tell me a bit about that where yes. they came into your journey also yeah um so back in my day of partying i was you know i did a i ate a lot of mushrooms and lsd and ecstasy and all like a lot a lot, a lot of things to with the intention of getting weird you know like let's let's get fucked up <laughs> and so for a while when i first stopped doing drugs and alcohol it was more i was like hmm, i probably won't ever do that again but then about five years in it got on my radar of like hmm that seems intriguing like the med the medical um, stuff coming out about it and the, and the not so medical stuff, like the experiential stuff, the ceremonies and all that stuff. Um, so it, it, I, the call came in and I took a few years to have the conversation and then um, started microdosing uh, about two years ago, uh, mushrooms. And so um, what triggered that was, is like I was talking about before, like for five or six years in, in sobriety, like I would, I was operating on what I knew. And what I knew was getting me the same results over and over, like doing, like trying, like for NAA, for example, like something's bothering me, I'm here again. Like, let me work the steps again. Let me look at the things that I don't, and I, I, I know about. And again, not poo-pooing AA or anything. It's great, it did a lot for me, but I had to step out of that and say like, I need to find out what I don't know about here. I need to tap into like the, the, the recesses of my brain and just tap into like other realities and other dimensions and just like what i need to do whatever i can to find out what are the real roots of these hooks like what is it what's going on like with my consciousness why am i where's my awareness lacking where's my consciousness lacking where's my self just like looking inward where where what am i scared to look at that i need to look at and so you and you talk about how they're they're tools that's it like it's not a magic pill there's no magic like magic mushrooms they call them magic mushrooms but like the, the ceremony and the medicine and the journey, that's one thing, but without, and I heard a great thing the other day about integration versus incorporation. So um, integration is the, uh, the, the, the wisdom and the knowledge that you gain from it, integrating that into your life. Whereas incorporation, so inc incorporate or inc inc the incorporation, the word, the root of it is in corpus, which is in corpse, which is in body. So incorporating is like, you have to embody the new stuff, the behaviors that, that you learn. Like you can't just do a, do a mushroom ceremony and then go back and do the same stuff over and over. Like you're just doing mushrooms at that point. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like you need to like the integration and incorporation have to happen. So on the other side of that is you have to really be committed to making these changes, you know, cause otherwise it, like there's, you're wasting your time in the, in the psych, I mean, psychedelics are psychedelics, but like you're not getting much out of it if you don't take the time after the, after the ceremonies to really put everything you learned into play and give it time. Like that's a very masculine way to say it about doing, but like giving yourself time to be with like what comes up over the next three, six, uh, nine weeks, whatever it is. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess next question for you, I got is um, you founded something called the Co conscious warrior brother brotherhood. Tell me about that yeah. and tell, tell me what it is. And, you know, for, for someone out there that hasn't really done any men work and hearing all these brotherhoods popping up, tell me a bit about what, what you guys do and, and what it's like and, and what, what led you to sort of found it. Um, so I just, you know, it's so hard to put into words the importance of brotherhood. 
it's like trying to explain Bufo to someone that has a <laughs> <laughs> like the it's another good analogy of brotherhood <laughs> yeah the importance of brotherhood is, i mean i could sit we could sit here and you and i get it so we can talk about it but like someone that hasn't done it imagine um let me say i'll say this imagine like it's just like getting into a place where you felt one way and done something one way your whole life and you think that you're operating at 100 percent, but really that 60 percent because you're holding on to something mm -hmm. when you can when you can look get in the presence of other men that are not there in judgment not there in um you know to make fun of and talk shit like they're there for serious work to hold space because they've been there and they've been through it and they know it when you can be seen by those men, like literally like your soul gets seen the amount of healing that comes up. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm almost tearing up right now. Just talking about it. Like the, the, the feeling like the, I remember my, the, one of the first times I went, like, it was like, this is the most healing experience I've ever had in my whole life. And I was the only thing I could say was thank you. Like it was just, there's nothing else that like, it felt too small, but at the same time it felt perfect. Like, thank you feels like to say thank you. And like, just like, I mean, I don't have to say anything else, just thank you. And to, to experience that is why I created the conscious warrior brotherhood, because what was the experience? Like what happened that led to that, that healing experience? So like, it was can about, you, can, you, can you share? So yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. So it was about, um, you know, I determined because of my asthma and allergies and the choking and um, as a kid that I was a broken human being and that I was a burden to everybody in my life. That means family, parents, everybody. And so I was always, always, always like, I need to be fixed. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to fix myself. I need to fix myself. I need to fix myself, which the idea and the theory there is great growth. But when you can, when you have it in you that you need to fix all the time, what you're really telling yourself is that you're broken. And so I had other men look at me and be like, you're not broken. Like you are a whole human being. Like you're not broken. You're not, you know, you went through that addiction or that the childhood stuff, but that's not who you are. Like you're, you're, you're standing here coming on the other side of that. And to say that they, just to hear it, just to hear that I'm not broken from another man, and like look in the boom. eye, like oh, boom, dude. Yeah. Like, I mean, little mind blown emoji, like times 50. Right. Right. Yeah. It's super interesting. And it seems so simple, but like when the heart opens in that moment, you know, it's, it doesn't even matter what's really going on. It's just like, so transformative, like that little sort of thing just clicks in or like the, mm -hmm. the, the circuit gets rewired and just like, boom, you come online. It's like, shit, I'm not broken. Yeah. And you know, like, I don't know why, but it just had to be said to me at this time in this way for me to really embody, embody it um, yeah. fully. And, you know, it sort of leads to my next question, which um, I've, I've, I've been really curious about whether it's psychedelics or men's work. And is, is there a natural process where we need to break down in order to sort of be reborn and to evolve as human beings, as souls? You know, like, like, is it part of this journey that we came to earth signing up for, Hey, I need to learn as a spiritual being in order to really learn, I got to break down and see the other side of what I'm trying to learn about, right. To go into hell, knowing that I'm going to pull myself back up and initiate myself in a human life, you know, something along those lines. Cause everyone has a different story of what, what they're their demons are what their their sort of stories are and what their their break is from you know um their soul or um their higher self and then there's this comes this realignment hopefully at some point in, in in their lifetime some people maybe not some people have it really soon uh but do you would do you think it could be a, a natural part of the human experience to have these sort of raptures or shifts and then coming back in, into uh, i guess alignment I would love to say that we you can find this path without it, but I don't think it's possible. Right. I think it's like the equivalent of like um, reading it from a book, like a psychology, you go to see a therapist that's read about depression from a book, but never experienced it. And then going to see a therapist that's actually experienced depression or a co men's coach, whatever it is. Like, I think that's the value of coaching over therapy is that coaches have experienced this experienced it mm -hmm. and so i think that i don't think there's any way to fully commit to this path without having a dark night of the soul or having some sort of something 
uh, you know, for me, it's a lot like I'm convinced that in a past life that there's, there's a lot to, for me around breathing. Um, I mean, asthma, inability, like lungs and breathing, uh, allergies, throat closing up, breathing. I would choke on my food a lot, breathing. Um, being underwater is a very scary experience for me, breathing. Like there's something about a past, and this is all stuff that's come up for me recently with diving into the psychedelics is that, and the breath work and all the stuff is that in a past life, I'm, I'm here for some karmic cleansing, some generational ancestral karmic cleansing. And I think that for me saying no to that, yeah, it's, it sounds a little woo woo and maybe a little crazy, but for me to say no to that is just saying it's, it's, it's not surrendering. It's not clo it's, it's closing myself off to the healing that I need to experience. And so I think that, I think there has to be, you know, like the, the rapture that you talked about, there has to be this, this progression of it, this evolution of it. And um, there's a, I don't even remember who said this quote, but like, I've never seen somebody that's um, on this path that hasn't gone through, hasn't gotten tired of their own bullshit or gone through their own, <laughs> their own thing to get right. there. And it's true. Yeah. Like it's, it just, it has to happen this way. And, th and that's fucking beautiful. I, I don't think I'd want it any other way. Like you think back when you're in those moments of pain, you want nothing but to be out of it. But looking back, it's like, what's the alternative? Just simple, boring, plain life that never has any problems that to overcome and to challenge and to grow. And I, I think it's like perfectly yeah. designed this way when we all think, oh, life is so hard and fucked up. It's, it's so beautiful that we get to experience the full range and, you know, come out on the other side and then get new challenges to sort of push us to grow even more. Um, so, so yeah, yep. so the great, great answer to that question. Um, and, and you mentioned breath work too. Like we have a, we have a whole breath work facilitator training program that um, sort of evolved over the last, you know, five years. That's been like monumental. And also like in our men's group, like just using the breath work to crack guys open, like full on emotional release. And, you know, I, I don't know what, what it is about it, but it just releases on such a deep level. And when you have a bunch of guys that are hold space that allows the vulnerability, it's like super powerful. Um, so breathwork's been a tool that, that I use and I, I'll put it right up there with psychedelics as far as um, the depth of the experience and the transformational potential and also, you know, way more accessible and, you know, you can use it every single day and it's free. So um, yeah, I'm yeah, glad you brought, I, I, brought that up. I'd put it right up in the psychedelics too. I mean, yeah. it's, it's basically, it's kind of a psychedelic experience when you get like, when you go deep into it, like I've done some three hour breath works, I've done some 30 minute stuff. I mean, it's a, it is an experience. Mm -hmm. It's oh, really yeah. amazing. And just think it's like always available to us. Always available. Yeah. Um, okay. I got two more questions for you. One. So you're recently on a TEDx talk. Tell me about that experience, how that yeah. come to be. Um, congratulations. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that experience was, um, it's not about the talk, <laughs> you know, like it was great to get up there and like part of my, my mission, my purpose is to impact 1 billion human beings. And so that's, that's an amplification of my purpose right there. But what I found is that, you know, it's talking about removing the hooks and removing the blocks that keep us from the things that we want that keep us from our purpose. And so I had to become a different man to, to even to get the talk and then to get on stage for the talk and then to, to do the talk was a looking back at it now that it's over is like, holy crap, like that was a pretty amazing journey. Um, one of the, 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 the way it looked like tangibly is that I sent out almost 200 applications to Ted, to the different Ted organizers. And, and uh, this is the one that chose me. So um, that's amazing. And what happened was with the Ted, this is a funny story. So I, I, uh, miscommunication, whatever, subconsciously, I, uh, my subconscious wants to go to chaos. Like that's, that's been my default for a long time. <laughs> and so, um, I always find my, I, I used to find myself in still do sometimes, but I find myself in like these panicky chaotic situations because I like, I sell, I subconsciously self-sabotage mm. this Ted talk. I subconsciously didn't either pay attention or know that I could use cue cards like a teleprompter. So I prepared as if there was going to be no teleprompter prompter like me up there doing my speech from memory from embodiment all that stuff so i went in i, I literally this is a 30 second switch i less than 15 seconds i was I, before i walked into the auditorium i was like panicky like reviewing my notes one last time and i walk into the auditorium and the organizer's like okay where's your where are your cue cards for the teleprompter i was like what like i get to use the teleprompter <laughs> so <laughs> so for me that experience 
is instead of subconsciously manifesting chaos, I subconsciously manifested over preparedness, the opposite mm-hmm. of chaos. Mm-hmm. And like, that's, that's like part of what Ted did for me. Ted, Ted leveled me up. And then nice. to give the talk about like the message of like, we need to stop settling for hope because hope, and again, I talk about this in the talk, but like hope is very romantic. It's sexy. It's easy. It feels good, but it doesn't get us anywhere. And like, I learned that through hoping rehab would save me, hoping girlfriends would save me, hoping drugs and alcohol would save me, like hoping something would come and save me always ended in pain and heartache for me. And so when I started like, and that's the thing with the psychedelics too, like those things help, but until I believe enough to take action, like love myself enough to believe in myself to take action, nothing changes. Love that. I love that. Um, Thanks brother. So the la- last thing I want to touch on, um, we're doing pretty good for time here. Um, you're the managing director of Five to Flow. It's a business organization. Tell me a bit about that. What, what's Five to Flow? Yeah. So um, is it inspired by Five MEO? I, I don't think so. But <laughs> <laughs> no, not not at all. But uh, it, it's more inspired by flow. So the idea of flow state. Um, so the 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 founders is uh, an old client of mine. She was a personal training client of mine, and then a life coaching client of mine, and then. Um, when quarantine hit, she was in New Zealand working for a consulting firm and it was, it was a terrible environment. Like there was toxic, toxic masculinity all over the place. Like the culture was awful. And so she left there and said, I want to start my own consulting firm. She had been consulting for, um, almost 15 years. And so she's like, I have this idea about a holistic organizational wellness consulting, as opposed to like business consulting. So we look at people, process, culture, analytics and technology. And I, she brought me in to be the managing director and the chief culture officer. So we have a, have a website, it's five to flow. So it's five, those five elements to achieve organizational flow. And oh, so we it. go in and we basically give them a diagnostic tool that we built that they can take and we get a score back um, one to five on um, 25 questions per category that all the employees take. And so we get a really, really, really acute, um, detailed score about where they fall one to five on basically those five categories. And so then we come in and say, all right, so, you know, like you could have all the highest, best technology in the world, but if your processes are terrible, it's like a square peg in a round hole because you're not taking advantage of your technology. And same thing is, is like you could have the best people in the world, but if they're all ships passing in the night, your culture needs adjusting to take advantage of all these great people. So it's really about finding that balance between all five of those categories and yeah, so we, uh, we built it. We spent all of quarantine, basically 2020, building this um, company. And there's 12, 12 managing directors now. Um, and we did, a, we did a soft launch in October for a, a telecom, telco company in New Zealand, a beta client. And then we did our, our hard launch in January. And so, yeah, we're off and running. So it's really cool. Like I get to, my role was actually kind of loosely based on Matthew McConaughey's Minister of Culture. Okay. We, we were like, let's, let's, uh, let's create something like a minister of culture. And I'm like, well, McConaughey already took that. So how about chief, chief culture officer? So I love it. Yeah. So I basically just, you know, I look at organizations and people both as organisms, you know, and they, they operate a lot in the same way. Like if an organization has, you know, for lack of a better term traumas, or if the people are experiencing traumas as a whole in the culture, there's going to be resistance and where there's resistance, there's no growth and people are the same way. Like these men, like the, the best way to find out what's bothering you or what's holding you back is to look at the things you resist and say, and so for the men, like I resist saying, I love you to my wife. Why? Well, because I love you wasn't said in my household growing up. Something like, it could be something like that total example, but look at what you resist and you will, you will find your freedom. You will find your path to freedom. Organizations are the same way. If you can find like where you're resisting using this technology, where are you resisting you know, morale or camaraderie amongst your culture, you will find innovation. You will find, because really safety in an organization promotes innovation and innovation is what promotes growth. Absolutely. I, I love that. And I think that, you know, like us trying to depend on our governments to change the world is, is probably a very long shot. But I think um, <laughs> organizations, entrepreneurs, companies have the power to create change at a much faster pace. I think the more we can sort of educate them to be more um, into flow, more balanced, more conscious, 
the more we're going to see this rapid change um, in humanity. So um, I'm a firm believer in all of that. And I think it's a, it's a great, great idea and company to sort of consult in a more holistic way rather than strictly, you know, about profit and, and, you know, again, those toxic masculine stereotypical sort of features that a lot of corporations is just like power, control, profit, money, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I guess in closing here, um, is, is there anything that, that I didn't ask you that I would, that you wish that I would, or that you want to express? Oh man, I think that was great. Actually, we covered a lot of ground there. Um, yeah, I think we're, I think we're good, man. I, it was really, really awesome. I feel really good about this. Awesome. Okay. So, so Sam, tell me, where can people get a hold of you? Um, social media, so, websites, anywhere that, that you'd like to get in connected with you. Yeah. Yeah, um, Instagram is where I'm most active. So it's at Sam Gibbs Morris on Instagram. Um, LinkedIn, I'm a little bit on there. Just my name, Sam Morris. Um, the, the, the website is samgibbsmorris.com for my one-on-one, -on -one, my men's coaching, my men's work. And the 5 to flow website is 5 to flow So it's F-I-V-E-T-O-F-L-O-W, 5 to flowcom Awesome. Well, guys, please check out Sam. And also thank you for watching, tuning in, listening, sharing, commenting. Appreciate you guys. Um, and yeah, we'll see you soon. Keep on being you. Keep growing. And uh, thank you for all your support. And thank you, Sam, once again, for everything that you do. Thank you. Keep up the great work. Yeah.